Tonight's topic is the Jewish approach to the paranormal. In fact, we're actually going to do a series of talks relating to topics in the paranormal over the next few weeks. The paranormal, the word paranormal, is a word coined in the early part of the 20th century that refers to any experience not in the natural experience of things. That doesn't have anything that doesn't have a natural explanation. It's a phenomenon that is currently beyond the ability of science to explain. Almost all paranormal experiences or occurrences are generally seen by the public as science fiction or urban legend, but many aspects have been upheld and established by, the scientific, by scientific scrutiny. A Gallup poll published in 2005 showed that an astounding three out of four Americans believe in some sort of paranormal activity, be it a haunted house, telepathy, whatever the case is, Three out of four Americans believe in it. Tonight's topic, tonight we're going to zero in on the Jewish idea of ghosts. Now, ghosts are something that have been referenced throughout history, since time immemorial. The ancient Babylonians was discussed in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, in ancient Greece, it was mentioned, ghosts were mentioned by Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. In the Roman times of later antiquity, we find references to ghosts all the way throughout history until we get to today. So what's Judaism's view on ghosts? Do we believe in them? Do we believe, do, does our belief in ghosts, is it have any symmetry to the way that society thinks of ghosts. It's like the white sheet people who make your curtain part and <laughs> scare you. And it seems kind of interesting also that you come to a synagogue and you're talking about ghosts. It feels like you know, kind of counterintuitive. Come to a synagogue, you talk about Judaism, you talk about you know, things related to Jewish religion, Jewish thought, Jewish law. But ghosts, such a, such a random topic, the paranormal, who would have thought? So ordinarily that might be the case. I've heard in the name of certain G'day Yisrael, certain contemporary Jewish sages, that actually encouraged not only the speaking about these topics, but also publishing books on these topics, because sometimes we as Americans, we as people, get so steeped in our material reality, get so hooked on our coarse physical existence that we forget about spirituality or other realms altogether. So at least in a roundabout way to get the inner machine going, thinking about something beyond the physical world. So they actually encourage speaking about the supernatural, the paranormal, ghosts, etc. We should know, and don't look over your shoulder, <laughs> we should know that we happen to live in a very busy atmosphere. There's a lot going on, even in this room, that we're not always aware of. We know for a fact that going through this room right now, there's microscopic bacteria, there's radio and TV waves, there's cell phone and internet signals. And then there's spirits. And then there's souls. Many people, when they think about a soul, when they think about the human soul, they look at it almost in the opposite of the way that it really is. Most people think that we are our bodies, when I, look at, when I think about me, I think of my body. 
and I happen to possess a soul. I am a body that happens to possess a soul that enlivens me, my body. In truth, it's the exact opposite. We, who are the real, who's the real we, who's the real me, is a soul. The real me is a soul. And the real me was a soul created at the beginning of time. My soul happens to occupy a body. Our souls happen to occupy a body right now. But the real you, the real me, the real us, is the soul. It's sort of like when an astronaut goes to outer space, and they start floating around, they do their work on the space station, whatever they're doing, they need to put on a spacesuit. In order to function in that to be exposed to those elements, they have to put on special equipment. They have to put on a special space suit. It works the same way when the soul comes down to this world. In order to be a part and influence physical reality, you need to don physical clothing. You have to put on the garb of a body in order to experience the physical world. You know, I... And anyone ever attended a funeral before, or anyone ever mourned a loved one, knows that according to Jewish law, you're supposed to rip your garment. You tear your garment as a sign of mourning. Now, aside from a way of expressing grief, the deeper reason behind that is to remind us that what has been lost is only the body. Only the body has been torn away. Only the garment has been torn away. But the soul remains and the soul continues on. So when the soul leaves the body, it exists on a different plane. Sometimes, many times, the soul immediately is able to go to Gan Eden, to heaven to the godly spiritual realm. Sometimes it needs to get purged from different infractions that it may have had throughout its life and get uh, to a certain point of purity where it will be able to experience that godly glow, that godly experience. Other times it's sent back down into a body in order to fix up something that it needs to correct. And then there are times where the soul wanders the world without a designated body. The soul lingers on without a body. So a ghost, in the context that we're going to be discussing it tonight, that we are discussing it tonight, is a departed soul who, for whatever reason, continues on in the physical world rather than ascending on high. It continues lingering in the world. One thing that's very interesting, for quite some time, the British Society of Psychical Research has conducted serious investigation onto the, onto the reality of ghosts. Most reports of ghosts happen to be either illusions or not hallucinations, but you know, you see uh, an apparition that's caused by light hitting the window at a certain angle and people... But, however, many cases have been verified as seemingly a real occurrence. And now, this, this British Society of Psychical Research is a, is a community of scientists, renowned, verified, veteran scientists who are doing these investigations, not some quack group that's uh, witch doctors and uh, trying to prove a point about metaphysics. These are real people, real investigations, hard scientific data. Through their investigations, certain cases where ghosts were reported were that ghosts were result that ghosts were reported as the result of a certain sudden or tragic death of a person, for example. So the testimony of feeling something by many different people, a variety of people, 
all their stories and all their things that they perceived and experienced all matched up. These are, again, were in cases of, of people who had died suddenly or tragically. In one investigation, a dog, a cat, and a rattlesnake all reacted to a certain unoccupied chair in a supposedly haunted house in Kentucky. The extrasensory perception of animals we know is very great. Animals sense things that human beings don't, don't sense at all. We often look at ourselves, and we should look at ourselves this way, as we are the crux, the height of existence. We are, we have, we are the, the top of the scale, human being. A human being is so high that he's able to, uh, given the right scenario, he's able to even communicate and uplift the world, communicate with God through prophecy, if he, if he became such a degree. Animals can't become prophets. Animals can't uplift the world. So we often look at ourselves as we are the, the head honchos of the world, and we are. But when it comes to sensitivity of perception, using our senses to sense what's there, sometimes animals have a greater deal and have a greater capability than even us on a normal, on a normal opera operation. Why is that? Sometimes we get so... We have in our mind, we have in our box what is considered reality and what's considered fantasy and only certain things that fit within our bubble are processed by our brain. Whereas animals are able to process and they can hear and feel other things that we are, not, or we are desensitized to or don't have the capability of, of experiencing on our own. Remember the tsunami last year in Japan? And the tsunami that happened in, also in Southeast Asia in 2004? There was reports that the animals were able to somehow, one way or another, sense that something was coming. They saw the animals behaving differently a few days before and, and going to different areas. We know that dogs have a remarkable sense of smell, that birds migrate based on uh, celestial cues, and that bats are able to retrieve their food through using echoes. So there's no question that animals have an extra bit of sensory perception than in human beings do. The truth is it doesn't matter if animals recognize it through a sixth sense, an actual sixth sense that humans uh, don't have, or whether it's just a heightened sense of awareness that something that we do have, they just have a more sensitive to it. Whatever the case may be, they have been receptive to these spiritual apparitions that human beings sometimes weren't able to uh, perceive right away. Feel the different vibration in the air, whatever the case was, animals were able to sense it sometimes where a human being couldn't. Sometimes when a human will experience, they'll go into a place that there is such a presence, they won't feel that there's another person in the room. They'll feel almost like there's a presence or a certain like uh, tingly feeling or whatever. But you know that feeling that you get where when someone's looking at you from behind and you just kind of know someone's looking at you and you, you turn around and there is someone looking at you? Where does that sense come from? Where does that, that, that sensitivity? So many people who have had this experience describe their experience with uh, a ghostly uh, apparition or a ghostly presence in a similar way. <coughs> there seems to be validation in the writing of the Jewish mystics on some of the conclusions that this research team has made. There's works in Jewish literature that discuss there is such an idea that a sudden or tragic death hurls the soul, at least for a temporary amount of time, into a continued existence in this world. The premature death, so to speak, causes the bodiless soul to continue occupancy in this world, where it lingers and tries to accomplish the mission that it hasn't yet accomplished. The mission, it was set here for a certain mission, it, its life was cut off tragically and suddenly, and it continues to perpetuate that goal of which it was sent here for initially. There is such an idea. There's also reference to being without a body, living in this world as a certain form of punishment. A person 
comes down numerous times, numerous tries to correct different things, and after X amount of times aren't successful, that for a certain amount of time they have to go without a body. And they're constantly pursued and but the physical forces, the, the spiritual forces that they're interacting with help refine it and make it prepared to go enter the next world.